So I will move on swiftly and introduce our first speaker, Ross Morrison McGill. I don't know that he needs so much introduction. He has been a secondary school teacher in some of the most challenging schools in London. In 2015, he was nominated by the Sunday Times as one of the 500 most influential people in Britain for his work in education. And today, he's going to talk to us about great teaching. How can we be the best educators we can possibly be? Ross. Okay, good, um, good morning everybody, thank you for coming. Um, my name's Ross, I've uh, been a teacher in London in high schools uh, for 25 years and uh, I started blogging, uh, I think I was an early adopter blogger because I was blogging in 2000 when you used to click the web page and it would take about a minute to turn over. Um, you might remember those IDSL ringing tones and things like that. So I've had lots of different blogs, but uh, probably my most um, well-known one is, is Teacher Toolkit. So I'm going to want to talk to you about um, some of the things that I've observed on my blog over the last decade. Um, so I'm going to kind of show you some insights, um, teacher habits, um, my own experiences of working in education here in England, because I know not everyone here in the room will be from England specifically, and um, talk to you about the pressures that schools are under, but also some of the amazing things that, that people are doing. So um, are we okay on the slides at the front? Have we got it up on the screen? Okay. There we go. So, um, books. I have loads of literacy demons, loads. I, I grew up in Scotland. Um, I wasn't necessarily taught grammar. Um, moved to seven schools as a child uh, through my mum and uh, dad's nature of work. And I would say blogging has improved me as a teacher, not only just from my literacy, but also when you tweet out to a quarter of a million people, you have one or two people tell you that you can't spell. So in, in my best interest, it's led to all sorts of interesting things such as books and speaking to you here this morning. So this is what I want to try and tackle. Uh, very kind of short insight. I'm going to give you the slides and a few ideas um, stitched right at the end. Um, but I want to kind of shape perceptions. Um, if school budgets in England are stretched... The curriculum is incredibly busy, and England PISA rankings standards are going up, then you could argue that our teachers are doing amazing work, no matter how much they cry out for more funding. Now, I, I've, I'm sure you have, if you're a teacher too, will know that schools, particularly state schools, are desperate for cash. Um, so I want to kind of just challenge some perceptions, um, highlight some of the work that some schools have done, and how they deal with the same challenges. So if you grab that, take a picture, or it needs a capital CPD, you can get all the slides. At the back end of the slides, I've just essentially given you 50 ideas. And if you uh, send me an email, I'll send you some PDFs to read uh, later today or tomorrow, something like that. So capital CPD to work. Uh, you get the slides and a few links. It'll take you to just a landing page on my site. I'll show you that at the end. So state of the nation. The working lives of teachers. Now, I'm currently doing my doctorate at Cambridge, and I'm looking at, currently, because I know um, your research focus changes quite a lot, um, but my current thesis topic is how teachers are using Twitter to enable teacher agency or teacher voice um, to influence education policy. We're, we're all journalists, we can all put out a tweet or a photo on Instagram, it can go viral, we can be quoted in the news. Um, and I've seen that happen to teachers over the last 10, 12 years since I've been using Twitter. Um, so I want to unpick it in a, a deeper level and show you how teachers can influence policy. I believe if teachers can mobilize themselves, choose one topic, so whether it's teacher pay, and everyone shouts about it, they can make a big difference to government policy. The problem with teaching is that there's so many things to tackle. 
uh, and things get uh, very thinly spread. This is just an in, uh, a back end of my website. Um, so it's a screenshot from November. So it's just reached about 11 and a half million readers. Um, I started with one blog. Now, I started my blog when I was made redundant, uh, Teacher Toolkit. I lost my job. Um, I took voluntary redundancy. My boy was born premature at the same time. Um, I found myself 90 miles away from home um, without a job in teaching after 18 years. And I just started writing a blog to update my family about his medical condition. That blog uh, in 2007 uh, went viral. Well, definition of a viral. Um, but it, it reached lots of people in the premature community. Um, came home, my son was on oxygen. Uh, wasn't in the classroom for the first time ever uh, in September. So I found that very strange. So I started to write about teaching. And after a couple of months, got back into classroom. And you can see now, 12 years later, blogging is my, it's my life. It's a daily habit. And essentially, um, I've been sharing asking questions, trying to find out solutions. That's all I've been doing. And because it's become a habit, I've been consistent. I've been clear about what I've been wanting to achieve. And I've, been, I've, I've offered some clarity and understanding for people reading. It's grown into this huge audience. Now, I'll give you some insights into the website. Um, the average reading time is a minute and 15 seconds. So you'll see lots of companies now stipulate how long it takes to read an article. Now, if you think of the life of a teacher, when the bell rings every hour and you're coming home, kids to bed, you might sit on the sofa and then look at your phone. With it all, lots of things pinging with notifications, you're, it's, it's, we're in an attention economy where people are competing for your attention. So I deliberately started to ensure that my blogs were no longer than three to 400 words. So if you go on my site, you'll see a big uh, a range of blogs. There's about 2,500 two and blogs, almost 2 million words. Um, because teachers are busy, they're time poor by default. So they need things that give them help very quickly. Um, the biggest thing that gets the most clicks is marking. Marking drives teachers nuts across the world. So when I look at the analytics of where people are reading, uh, what locations, um, it's always I'm needing ideas for marking or lesson planning. The second biggest topic is differentiation. Now, uh, I'm not sure if everyone in the room, maybe from different parts of the world, understand this, but it's essentially meeting the needs of individual children in a class. The problem we have in England currently is that, um, or at least the dialogue 10 years ago, was that um, there was a need for teachers to meet individual children's needs in one-off lessons. The byproduct of that was 30 lolly sticks, seven or eight different translated worksheets, and someone would be observing that teacher. It's a myth. It's not possible. And the narrative of the differentiation or the definition has been lost in translation. Differentiation is meeting needs of your children over an academic year. Teach to the top and then navigate your interventions. Um, so marking and differentiation, the top clicks. Now, I, I've had the real privilege. So I, I left my deputy headship two years ago, um, being asked to share lots more things. So I, I committed to kind of training teachers and managing the blog full time. So I've been to about 170 schools in the last two years. So I also want to share what I've seen on my travels. Um, this is just an insight into my Twitter analytics. So that's a three month screenshot. Uh, people in the room who are not familiar. So impressions, so 17 million people in three months see my tweets. Impression means, it doesn't necessarily mean someone reads your content, but they see your information go past their screen. Okay? A click would be you click on the photograph or the hyperlink. So the stats will be much lower. You can see the stats there. Okay? Um, so I know that I have a huge responsibility, almost kind of a social mobility moral to... Um, entice the next generation of teachers into the profession, challenge policy makers, but at the same time try and support the teachers who are currently dealing with those challenges. And it's quite a hard um, balance to, uh, to kind of strike. I guess my top tip, don't tweet after a glass of red wine. Okay, I've, I've made that mistake. Um, 
Every three or four months, I do my own little Twitter survey. And I ask who's to blame for teacher workload, or not to blame, what, where are the forces coming from? So you'll see here Ofsted, which is, if you're not familiar from England, it's the inspection system we have here in England. Is it school leaders? So not just the head teacher, but anyone in the school who is in charge of somebody else. The Department for Education moving the goalposts to so different frameworks. Or is it teacher habits? I will mark all my books because it makes me feel good. And then I'll go to the staff training session and then look at me, look at all my shiny books. I would like to work in a school where I can bring my worst books so that I can get help. And I need to work in a school where I've got the right soil where I can thrive as a profession. Teaching's a team sport. You cannot solve it on your own. You need experienced colleagues around you to help solve complex classroom problems. I often say on my travels, there's a special place reserved in hell for teachers who don't share. And I think I would attribute my growth to sharing ideas, questions, helping people, and helping solve problems. And if I didn't know, I got the answer back and it helped me. Um, so, you can see here at the top, 2017, school leaders. And I was a bit frustrated. I was a deputy head at the time when I was analyzing workload. And this is largely influencing a lot of my uh, uh, doctorate thoughts for my, my thesis. But you can see here, Ofsted just changed its new framework. So if you're not familiar, um, can I just have a show of hands rather than guessing? If you're not based in, in the UK and you've come from overseas, can I just have a show? OK, so I need to make sure that I give lots of context. So here is the inspection for, uh, organization that it judges schools. I'm currently looking at, at my doctorate level that I think when you grade a school, so the current term is called stuck schools, it puts that school into another decade of difficulty stroke poverty for the pupils and parents that it serves, rather than telling parents that's a good school. I believe every school is good. There are one or two that have extreme difficulties and serious safeguarding concerns or are illegal, but the vast majority of schools are doing good for their parents and pupils. Uh, more on that one later. So you can see there's been a shift. Now, I apologize for the small detail here, um, but this is the, the head count of teachers in England today. So a little snapshot, there's 32,000 schools in Britain, there's 23,000 schools in England. There are 453,000, so almost half a million, qualified teachers in England. When you include universities and tutors and things like that, it goes up to about a million. Every year, so this data goes back 20 years, every year we broadly get about 25,000 teachers every year. Two summers ago, when the census data was collected, in England was the first time ever in 20 years we lost more teachers than we gained. And it's never happened before. So that, for me, that rings an alarm bell. What are the reasons? I also think social media, the way that you can teach, you can coach online, you can create resources, make an income from your, your, your desk at home. Uh, I think with the world of ed tech and this environment here today, there are different ways that we can all work. And I think schools, particularly teaching, faces those challenges in the next decade. Every year, I apologize for this being blurred, but that's 64, 62, 60. It goes down 2% every year you're in the profession. So 25 years, for me, I was off the scale, 38% of chance of staying in the teaching profession. Your own country should have this data. My argument here is, we often hear in the press or from the media, or from politicians that teachers leave within the first five years. In America, it's 60% attrition. In England, it's 40. But it's not true. The greatest attrition happens in the first two or three years of teaching. I go into the school. It's not what I expected or I'm not supported or the workload's incredible. And I leave the profession altogether, never mind leave that school. Um, and also, Including myself here, there are 350,000 qualified teachers in England who don't work in schools. And that data goes back 10 years. So we have enough teachers. We can't keep them or get them to come back in to work in the profession. So these are the kind of things that I've been uh, uh, looking at. I'm going to skip this just because I'm conscious of the technology not working. Uh, 
the irony, um, and just show you the workload survey. So this was from our Secretary of State in 2013, Nikki Morgan. Um, she conducted a workload challenge report in 2013. You'll see at the top, 44,000 teachers responded. 56% said, we're sick of putting data on software, he says, as an ed tech event. Um, second event, marking, which confirms what I've seen on my website and on my travels. And then I often say here, hands up if you like a meeting in your place of work. Does anyone like a meeting? OK, in school, a couple of people. No one likes meetings. Research is clear, have a stand-up meeting, it's going, going to go quicker. If you work in a school after a five-period day, you need a cup of tea and maybe a donut, a bit of sugar, and don't keep me for an hour with a to-do list. Let me go and get on with them, make the meeting brief. Um, also mental health, walk about meetings, face-to-face -face conversations, walk around the school environment, really good for your mental health. Why do teachers leave? Workload's the biggest reason. There's the inspection pressure there again behavior features, and so does teacher salary. We've just had an announcement in England a couple of days ago with another kind of minimum pay rise for teachers. Um, I've got a colleague at Cambridge, Jude Brady. She's analyzed the differences between um, independent teachers and state school teachers and the differences. So I've highlighted here marking. So it's quite low there, about 1,000 teachers surveyed. In state schools, marking's right at the top. She found that both types of teachers work in excess of 50 hours per week to keep on top of their day job, but the biggest difference between working in the state sector to independent was the state school teachers believed they were always asked to complete meaningless tasks, things that didn't add value to them as a professional or to their children. It was often for monitoring purposes. Um, now, I don't believe this research, but I do trust the Think Tank Education Policy Institute um, the average working hours of teachers, apparently teachers are working fewer hours last academic year. You can all laugh if you don't believe it. I'm not sure. But you can see there, 10 years, teacher, 45, school leader, anything between 55 and 70 hours a week. Okay, despite contracts at 32 and a half hours. This is one more interesting slide I want to show you. A lot of schools have been tackling um, these topics to reduce workload. But the interesting point I want to point out here is these two areas here, those teachers say it's actually had the opposite impact. So yes, tackle these topics on workload, but actually it's made my job harder. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so I said earlier, reduced budgets, tougher exams, crowded curriculum, uh, we're getting better in PISA if we believe in that methodology. Um, so teachers must be doing something right. So on my travels research, this is just a snapshot of England. I've been to about 13 countries the last two years. It's been the most fascinating thing ever, and I want to share it. Um, so top 10 issues. So I'm ignoring funding because every school needs more cash. I'm just going to talk about the things that all schools face. These are the schools that I selected. I had to choose schools beyond my own narrative, beyond my own bias. So there's schools in here um, in different parts of the country, small, big, independent, primary grammar, all sorts of things. These are the topics on the right that all schools face. Behind the scenes with a head teacher, we had a bit of a fist fight, and they all said, we do this one thing really well. Could you write about this in your research? So these are the topics. Now, I'm going to give you all the slides. I'm going to skip these because I was going to get you to some voting, and it's not working, so I'm going to skip past this. He says, now it's all going to crash. And the data I've collected, so from the 10 head teachers and the 250 teachers that I interviewed, I collected about 10,000 points of data. These are what the head teachers say are their strengths, managing pupil mental health, curriculum, and teaching and learning. Where head teachers struggle is not only uh, being really confident, but the challenges of having less funding, managing teacher well-being, and research. There's been a huge boom with research in England. I think it's fantastic. The trouble is teachers are time poor. Sometimes the research is inaccessible. It's expensive. And one, can we trust it? And two, it or five, it doesn't even tell us what to do. It gives us recommendations, but in practice, it doesn't tell teachers. Hallelujah, teachers say teaching and learning is their strength. Okay, so that's good. 
okay? But where they struggle is managing their own well-being, managing pupil health uh, with reduced funding, maybe losing a teaching assistant in the classroom, and managing complex special educational needs. So the conclusions I have for you. Um, this is what I think I've seen on my travels. And I just want you to think just for a moment, where do you see your own, if you work in a school, where do you see your organization on this chart? Because I've tried to articulate in the book um, where I've seen schools getting it right. I've seen lots of teachers leave the UK, go over to Dubai, Australia, and what have you. I've met one teacher who hasn't been observed for eight years. I think that's quite a lonely place to be if no one's checking in on your practice. You come back to the UK, you're way behind pedagogy. I do believe we need a small dose of this to achieve that. And we need that coherence and clarity because if you're working in a school with 30 teachers or 100 teachers, one interesting point I want to make is not one school can claim to have 100% consistency, but yet school leaders are desperate to achieve it. And then if I come to inspect your school and you've written something in a non-statutory document such as a teaching and learning policy, I might beat you over the head about it if you say your teachers will mark with a purple pen. And I look in your book and there's no purple pen evident. So all sorts of things. So uh, schools that are getting it right, in my opinion, have a dose of this to get to here. And the struggle is to try and stay there. CPD is protected. Research about long-term memory as kids need to be regularly quizzed to support their long-term retention. Then so do teachers. The bog standard model is five inset days a year. And the schools that are getting it right have abolished this and have staggered professional development throughout the academic year. Why? It allows me to talk to colleagues to share and solve complex problems, practice it in my classroom, come back a couple of weeks later and share and compare. And look, it didn't work for me. Look at my worst books. Don't beat me up. I'm just trying to work out what works. And it's research informed. And that position where coaching is starting to immerse classrooms rather than grading teachers, and teachers are now starting to open their doors. I also am a huge advocate for teachers filming themselves teach, and I don't think there's enough of it. And I really hope at some point, whether it's Research Ed or the Chartered College of Teaching, can get a huge bank of British teachers teaching kids in British classrooms so we can learn from one another. The teacher mindset is I can only see a week ahead. That's their work in life. They may be able to think half a term ahead in terms of a scheme of work, but they're limited because they lack time. So what we now see is teachers accessing professional development in the evenings on Twitter or Saturday organizing their own events. The problem is the quality of CPD isn't good enough in their own schools for lots of reasons. Um, and that's how I see schools that are doing a great kind of cultural shift in professional development for teachers. We all have choices. I know life gets in the way, bereavements, redundancy, broken legs, those types of things, location and travel. But we, we do, to a degree, have a choice in where we want to work. And I think with the use of social media now, particularly younger teachers entering the profession, if they can see Ross tweeting some great ideas about what they do in their school, I'm going to move down the country and go and work in that school because I like what I see and I know I'll be supported. And it's a hard balance between schools to promote use of social media without it damaging not only pupil mental health, but teacher mental health. So back in your schools, when last did your school talk about teacher mental health? Because we all have it. We all, we all need to manage our mental health, whether it's walking the dog or not marking books on a Sunday night. And I think that's the schools that are starting to protect their teachers. I think that's the framework or methodology to achieve it. Um, so, just kind of signpost it and I'll take some questions. Um, I've written a book, it's just one of the things that I, as a result of the blog. Um, you can download the poster, which is a summary of um, the schools. Here it is here, it kind of, you can blow it up to A2, stick it in your staff room if you're interested. Um, at the back end of all the slides, you've got all the 50 ideas in the book. And if you um, send me an email, I'll give you an insight into the 10 schools case studies. But essentially, that's how the book is framed. Much of the content or ideas are on the blog also. 
Okay, teachers are time poor. They don't have a lot of cash. They don't necessarily want to spend 15 pound on a book. I shouldn't be saying that. My publisher will tell me off. Okay, but I'm doing a signpost. Here's one sample chapter. At the back end of the slides, there's another 10 of these. This is the marking and assessment chapter. And I've tried to look at, at a system level, rethinking homework, comparative assessment, whole class assessment, AI, artificial intelligence, it's all over. Um, all over this event today, and the use of verbal feedback. I've just published some research with UCL on verbal feedback. Teachers that head and heart conflict, I know when I speak to kids it makes a difference, but there's not much academic research to back that up. So with UCL, 13 teachers, seven state schools, very disadvantaged schools in England. We published some research in September last year. The headline message from me was, with structure and routine, when teachers use scripted verbal feedback, it has no detrimental impact on pupils' outcomes. And the response I always get is, so how can I, demonstrate, how can I evidence verbal feedback? Well, the point being, if you've got kids that are struggling with attendance or high exclusions, there's some data if that shifts because teachers are talking to kids. Not a lot of teachers know the etymological meaning of the word assessment. Does anybody know? Hands up. Assessment. What's its root meaning? Its Latin origins. Assessment. Look it up. To sit beside. We need our teachers to be equipped to sit beside children. Why? Relationships. Immediate feedback. Understanding I engage and I improve the work. EdTech gives a solution because we can do that immediately and the kids get grades and quizzes. But some schools don't have the technology. So we rely on thumbs up, thumbs down, or mini whiteboards and those types of traditional methods. There's the link, folks. Capital CPD. There's another 10 of those ideas at the back. Um, if I could just summarize the things that I've been seeing, it'd be these types of things. So I think I've got te uh, nine on here. OK? All leaders must reduce workloads. If you're a key stage three coordinator in charge of literacy, you're responsible for workload pressure on somebody else. Habits and perceptions. Teachers don't leave in the first five years, they leave in the first two. We need to challenge the narrative. If I go to your school and your marking policy says mark once a week, I think that's not a good idea. Because all I'll be bothered about as a teacher is the assessment driving the curriculum rather than the curriculum driving when I need to assess. So if you say mark once a week, use the purple pen of progress, it's not going to be helpful. There's loads of other things there. I'm going to pause for some questions. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I hope you've learned one or two things. Please connect on Twitter or send me an email. I've got loads of things I want to share. 30 minutes is not long enough. Um, but thank you for your time and also take some questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ross. That was fantastic, actually, to hear it's not reinventing the wheel, but rethinking how we do things. Thank you. Does anybody have, we've time for one question. Does anybody have a question they would like to ask? We've got someone here on the screen. Okay. There you what go. inspired you to start teaching? Um, I love design technology, hence toolkit. And... Uh, it was, for most people, it's often the relationship you have with a teacher that makes a difference. So for me, it was my love of design technology. My mother and father were Salvation Army officers working in homeless hostels. So my entire home environment from the first 19 years of my life, I'd come home from school and I would be in an environment with uh, drug addicts, schizophrenics, alcoholics. I'd play pool with them after school. I don't think that would happen today with all the safeguarding checks, but um, that was 40 years ago. Uh, and I had this teacher that could see uh, my potential. Um, and I think moving to seven schools, if you're familiar with Hattie and his effect sizes, one effect size, you move schools. Well, there's no surprise you don't get good exam grades. So I had to reset my uh, GCSE qualifications in order to get the ticket to the next step. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more. How do you see the future of education changing in the next 10 years? Uh, well, I think the, the notion of a school building is going to change physically. You know, virtual schools, for example. Kids can learn online. Um, ed tech and artificial intelligence, all these bits of software out here has not... I know they'll consider teacher workload, but 
government level, if I'm salaried to, to work 32 and a half hours a working week, no one's considered how many times I have to read an email or log on to Sims to input some data. And I think the emergence of ed tech is making the job as a teacher not only better, but harder because there's lots more things to do in terms of logging in, tracking information, producing reports, and not necessarily telling me what to do next. Uh, or I have even less time, so you'll find all of us emails on our phone, despite us paying for our own phone contract, deleting emails on the bus home just to keep up with the dialogue, Reply, uh, getting frustrated because Ross replies to all when he doesn't need to, all sorts of things. And I think, I think we need to tackle the technology aspects of teacher workload in the next decade because I do think it's going to drive um, our own mental health and our own use of screen time. Uh, for the last three months, I've been leaving my phone downstairs in the house and I've seen a big difference to my own mental health from doing it. If I get four, four or 5,000 notifications a month just on Twitter alone. I can't keep up with them all, so I have to manage that myself. Thankfully, I'm in a position where I can do that, but our children can't, and maybe young, inexperienced teachers who come into the profession, having always known a mobile phone, um, they will need that, that support. So I think the notion of a building is going to be a challenge in 10 years, and the, the ed tech revolution, that fourth industry, I, I, I do see there's going to be a few problems with it. Okay, thank you, Ross, again. That was fantastic. And remember, according to Ross, if you want to influence policy, tweet constantly about one thing only. Okay, thank you. Yes, Ross. thank you, everybody.